vaccines don't cause autism, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe they don't, but they definitely cause encephalitis. You get injured by that vaccine. You don't go and sue the vaccine company. Instead, you're compensated by this national program that we have. It's like, hey, well, just go out there, eat some pizza, drink some pop, smoke some cigarettes, and drink some beer, you guys. But get your COVID vaccine. <laughs> You'll be all right. Like, so I'm doing it in this video. I'm going to share with you guys why I am skeptical of vaccines. And this is something like, I mean, I've been skeptical for vaccines now for about five years. So this whole skepticism started before the whole COVID thing. And this is a video that I wanted to make years ago. In fact, I thought about making a whole prior to like making my nursing channel surrounding mental health. I thought about making an entire channel around vaccines because I find them just so fascinating. And I was hesitant to make this video because you're always, as a creator, you're always worried about potentially violating the policies of YouTube and having your ch channel taken down, right? And I spent like hours and hours on my channel making videos. And the last thing I want to have happen is to have my channel taken down. So in this video, I don't think I'm violating any YouTube policies. I'm not contradicting what local health authorities or anything are saying, things like that, or what the, what the World Health Organization or whatever. I can't remember YouTube's exact policies, but it's something like along the lines of if you contradict what the CDC says or like the WHO says or local health authorities, your, your channel can potentially be banned or that video might be censored or whatever. So in this video, I'm just going to explain why I, me personally, am, am skeptical of vaccines. And I'm not trying to like um, proselytize here. I'm not trying to convert you or anything like that. Like I'm literally just sharing with you. Like if you're like, Nick, why are you skeptical of, of, of vaccines as a nurse? This would be my, my explanation. So here's how the story goes. So I used to be very pro-vaccine. I used to be one of those people like, if you told me you weren't gonna get vaccines for X, Y, and Z reason, I didn't care what your reason was. I'd be like, okay, great. That sounds um, phenomenal. Just put on your little tinfoil hat, grab your little coat hanger, go out into the forest and find us some water while you're at it, right? Like literally, that's probably what of what's something that I would have said. And up until, I don't know, maybe... I mean, up until probably I was the age of like, I don't know, 32, 33, I was completely vaccinated more or less for everything that you could be vaccinated with. Like if I were to put my immunization record up here, I'll show my immunization record. I'll put it on screen here just so you can see, like I've had a number of immunizations. And if I could go back, I would probably not have any of those immunizations. So let me explain why I'm skeptical about vaccines as I take a drink of my water here. This is distilled water, it's very good. So in nursing school, come my senior year, we had this class, I forget the name of it, it's some sort of like public policy, public health kind of class type thing, right? One of these senior classes, everybody kind of thinks it's a joke and we're just like, we're ready to graduate so we can get on and be nurses and make money. Well, I'm reading through this book that we had and was talking about vaccines and how they're one of the greatest pu public health measures ever invented and it's prevented all this disease and stuff. And I'm on board with it. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. Like, why do we even have to have a chapter about this? Well, then I get to this part that talks about the national, I think it's the National Childhood Immunization Act. And it was passed in 1986. And being the libertarian that I am, I'm very skeptical of government. I like minimum government. I hate when government intervenes with stuff. I can't stand governmental censorship, censorship and all that. And I'm being open about my political side here because it is probably a bias that you should be aware of watching this video. And so being skeptical of government, anytime they inter intervene with industry, I'm always like, hmm, what's going on here? So... In 1986, Congress passes this act that essentially makes vaccine manufacturers immune from any sort of lawsuits surrounding liability with their products. So let's say they make a vaccine, you get injured by that vaccine, you don't go and sue the vaccine company. Instead, you're compensated by this national program that we have that says, hey, if you've been injured, here's some money that we've allotted for those who might be injured by vaccines. Here's some money for you. Now leave the pharmaceutical company alone, let them keep manufacturing their vaccines. So when I'm reading this in the book, and, and being the skeptical person that I am of government, I'm like, what? What is going on here? Like, you mean to say that we have taken the pharmaceutical industry and taken away all liability from their vaccines? And it's not, when I say all, 
it's like probably 99 point something percent. Like if you really want to sue a vaccine manufacturer, you can, but you got to jump through so many incredible hoops. It's almost impossible to get there for like the average person like you and I who might be living paycheck to paycheck or might not have a lot of money to hire an attorney. Good luck jumping through all those hoops. <clears throat> So some of you might out there might be wondering, well, like, why did they pass that act? And that was the first question that came to my mind. So like, here's the common narrative, right? The reality is there were a lot of kids who were potentially getting injured by vaccines to the point where the amounts that the pharmaceutical companies were having to pay were starting to exceed the profit they were getting from that from the vaccine. So the government steps in and they're like, well, to ensure the public's health, which to me is always a red flag, like anytime the government's like, well, to ensure the public anything, like my red flags go up because I always feel like there's something sinister or something untrustworthy going on. But to ensure the public health, and we know that there's going to be this very, 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 very small percentage of people who get injured by vaccines. We're going to compensate them. The, manuf the, the pharmaceutical companies can still manufacture vaccines and all that, but we'll compensate them knowing that the, the general good of the public public is still maintained having vaccines circulated throughout the United States, right? So that's kind of the standard error. It's like a cost benefit analysis that they provide. And to me, I just, I don't buy it. It's like, I would never hop into a vehicle. Well, I should say never, but I would probably not drive a vehicle or buy a vehicle if you were just like, oh, hey, by the way, before you buy your uh, Toyota over here, just to let you know, the manufacturer has no liability if you get hurt in an accident, but you can be compensated, but you'll have to jump through a bunch of these hoops to be compensated. You know, like if all of a sudden your uh, steering wheel pops off while you're driving or like you're driving and your freaking tire just like, pops off it's not their fault but we'll compensate you all right you'll, you'll be all right so like to me it's very suspicious like that to me was probably the first red flag well, I was like bro what is going on with vaccines like that seems really suspicious and then just the more and more I read about them the more I was like I don't really know about these vaccines and they're kind of unique when you think about vaccines they're a medical intervention, right? But they're, they're a unique medical intervention in that they're one of the only things that we recommend for like healthy people. Like you could be the most healthiest person in the world and they're still going to recommend vaccines for you, which I just like, okay, that's kind of interesting because like every other medical intervention that we have, you generally have to have a, diagnos a diagnosis or some sort of ailment that suggests that you should have that medical intervention, right? So vaccines are very, very unique. So because of that unique that uniqueness, we want to make sure that they're very safe and very effective. And unfortunately, I just don't necessarily think that's the case for all vaccines. And I often think that this kind of one size fits all approach is completely arbitrary and just utterly ridiculous. Like the fact that we just recommend this, this um, giant slew of vaccines to every American child is uh, pretty incredible to me. And it's kind of incredible to think that we're going to take this brand new born baby and we're just going to inject it with all of these chemicals like on day one. Like that to me seems pretty skeptical. So if any of you out there are wondering, my two kids are completely unvaccinated. And this is another fact that, you know, I will share with people when I'm talking with other parents at the park and things like that. And somehow we bring up like medical stuff. Sometimes I'll, I'll share that with them. But it's something that I'm hesitant to share because you always wonder what are the repercussions for my family and for my children. But at this point in my age, I'm kind of to the point where I'm like, I don't give a fuck anymore. Like I should be able to raise my family in however manner that I see fit, as long as it's not like grossly negligent or abusive, like by all means, who gives a flying hoot, right? Like that's where I'm at in my life and in my age right now. I'm just like, you know what? I'm just gonna speak what I believe to be the truth and what I believe is to be backed by evidence. And if you wanna have your own delusions, then like go ahead and have your own delusions. But again, I wanna reiterate, I'm not like anti-vaccine and I actually really love the idea of inoculating us with something that's like weakened or dead or whatever. It's maybe like a little micro particle of whatever and then our body develops immunity to like, I think that's actually pretty cool. But what I'm skeptical about is like, let's take the hepatitis B vaccine, right? That's a vaccine that they recommend for newborn babies to prevent hep B. But I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, why, why on earth would I ever give my healthy baby a hep B shot? And, and I'm just considering like, this is not advice for anybody else. This is me and my own personal circumstance. When I think of like where my child's going to be, what the potential is that he'll be exposed to hep B, 
what the potential is that even if he's exposed that he contracts hep B. And then even if he contracts hep B, that it's going to be this lifelong illness when it's not usually for a healthy person. So the reality is like, I did not get hep B for my kid. I'm like, well, I don't see how he's ever going to be exposed to hep B. Like the the possibility of him being exposed to hep B is just so infinitesimally small. I cannot justify giving him that vaccine where if you look at the side effects of hep hepatitis B, I'm like, well, some of those side effects might be more possible than his actual exposure to hep B. So why would I want to get that vaccine? It doesn't make sense to me. Now, I can't give you a breakdown of like what all the side effects are of vaccines, and I don't really study vaccines like I used to. So a lot of this is just coming from memory. But what I will say is that when I was researching vaccines, one of the common side effects for I don't want to say all of them, but most of them is encephalitis, which is brain inflammation. And if you think like, well, what can happen from brain inflammation? The answer is I don't know. But I feel like almost anything, anything is possible through brain inflammation, depending on the severity of the inflammation. And so when people say things like, well, um, vaccines don't cause autism, I'm like, OK, maybe, maybe they don't. But they definitely cause encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. Now, can we prove that inflammation of the brain doesn't necessarily lead to autism or some sort of autism spectrum disorder or some sort of symptom of autism? I don't know, because to me, it doesn't seem that far fetched that you could have encephalitis, which would then lead to brain damage. And somehow that brain damage would lead to symptoms of autism. Now, I'm, I'm not saying specifically autism, but it might lead to symptoms that we see in a children that's like, eh, that kid seems kind of autistic to me. So I don't know that we can necessarily rule that out. And then if you look like at the whole, um, who's the guy that I'm having a brain lapse here, but there's a guy, I think it was back in the eighties and everyone's like, oh yeah, he said that vaccines led to autism and that's been refuted yada yada and if you like really i think it's andrew wakefield if you actually like look and like really read <laughs> into the details of that he never said that vaccines caused autism i think he was a stomach doctor gastro whatever it's not coming to my mind right now gastroenterologist and i think they did this very small case study involving like 12 boys maybe or something like that and he noticed that those who had received the MMR or something had a higher rate of autism. I can't remember the exact details, but it was to him, it was just like, okay, it's correlated. It's not causative, but it's correlated. And it's kind of like when you do a pilot study and it's a very small study and it's like, ah, this is, this is kind of interesting here. We're noticing this. Our sample size is super small, but let's investigate. Like that's pretty much all he was saying. And then I think later what happened is they retracted his article. Then they, and I think they even took away his license, but then they later reinstated both. If I am remembering correctly, but then the news never covered the reinstatement of either of those things. It's like a very, very biased. It was a very biased coverage of the whole incident. And why am I talking about this? I don't know why I went off on this tangent. So let me give you some more reasons why I'm like skeptical of vaccines. So if you look at the research about, and this is prior to COVID, like, I don't know what it's like after the whole COVID vaccine and stuff like that. I think like COVID has thrown everything as far as like vaccine statistics. I think it's like disproportionately affected the other vaccines, so to speak. And by the way, you just can't lump like when I say vaccines, it's kind of like saying like medications, right? You can't just like necessarily lump them all together. So I'm not trying to do that, but we can look at them collectively and be like, okay, well, here are some common side effects. Like here's the amount that our government pays out on an annual basis to those who are injured by vaccines, et cetera. So let me just give you some more reasons why I'm skeptical of vaccines. And I had a reason. And now that I'm speaking to you, I'm forgetting about it. I'll take a drink of my water and that'll refresh my memory. I know what it was. So if you look at the literature about vaccines, prior to the whole COVID thing, it was estimated that maybe like 1% of all vaccine side effects and adverse reactions were reported. And there's this thing called VAERS. It's like the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System that even if, say you're a provider, and you, I think you can even fill one out if you're not a provider, but say you go to your provider and you're like, hey, I just got this vaccine 
And now I'm noticing just like some altered sensations in my peripheral fingertips. And it's like kind of, I don't know, zingy or whatever. And I'm just like, yeah, I just feel like it's kind of part of the vaccine. And say your provider's like, nah, that vaccine couldn't have caused it. That's not what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is that regardless if the provider thinks that the side effects you're experiencing are from the vaccine, they're supposed to report it to this VAERS because this VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, is supposed to act like kind of this post-marketing surveillance that the vaccine companies have to maybe catch side effects that they didn't have in their clinical trials. Because the, the reality is that even if they're completely honest, which is a big if, right? But let's just say hypothetically, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they're really honest about their study. They may not catch every side effect in that sample population in their clinical trials because it doesn't represent the entire population that's going to receive the vaccine. So maybe there's something that they missed or maybe there's a subset of the population that has some weird whatever genetic variant or whatever that they missed or it's I don't know like a population that works in coal mines and for whatever reason the interaction between coal dust and vaccine you know what I mean like something weird like that that they're not going to catch in their clinical trials that's supposed to be caught in this VAERS like you're supposed to get enough of these reports even if it's bizarre like um I had a vaccine and I noticed that like my right ear is a little shifted down compared to my left ear. That's just like something, some crazy example that I'm coming off the top of my head. But even something like that, it's supposed to be reported such that if enough people are reporting that similar side effect in a geographical location or whatever, then you can start to say, well, wait a minute. The CDC might be like, well, we are noticing this. Let's, we need to run some studies about this to see if that's actually like a potential side effect. So that's the whole point of VAERS. And am I getting off topic here? How did I get into this? I think my point was that many providers kind of brush off the potential side effects that vaccines have. And so if we estimate that only 1% of the vaccine's side effects are being reported, then that means that like there's a ton of side effects out there that haven't been reported. And so when we do this cost benefit analysis of like, should someone receive the vaccine, we don't really know what the risk is because the risk has just been absolutely downplayed and hasn't been reported the way it should have. So that's another reason that I'm skeptical of vaccines is that it's very difficult for us to do that cost benefit analysis with without really knowing what the true side effect profile of vaccines is. Um, and I, guys, I... <laughs> I have to admit, I don't have any rubric, no skeletal outline for this video. So this is probably just another one of my crazy talk off the head moments where I'm just going to try to give you some more information regarding why I'm skeptical of vaccines and we'll go from there. So another reason that I'm skeptical of vaccines is if you consider this kind of 1% statistics, if you consider all the hoops that people have to go through before they're compensated and to consider the fact that, and this is, I'm going to say like, just going to give you like four years ago, this was relatively true prior to COVID. But if you were to look at our national payouts in the United States for those injured by vaccines, not necessarily injured, but they think eh, they might have been probable, probably injured by the vaccine. It averages around like $200 million a year, give or take. You can look this up, Google it. You'll see like some years it's higher than those. I'm sure with the last years with COVID, I don't know how they handled COVID and, and, and vaccine injury and all of that. But if it's part of the same system, I'm sure that number is drastically increased, especially because so many people were getting that vaccine. Like even if it was relatively safe, you're still going to get people who have side effects that have to be compensated, right? So given the fact that $200 million a year is paid out and that people have to jump through this whole legal system to, to get the payout, and given the fact that only roughly maybe 1% of vaccine side effects, adverse events are reported, that number should be a lot higher. It's kind of scary. And then if you look at all this anecdotal evidence surrounding vaccine injury, uh, it, it just Google like um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, flu vaccine. You can find people that have all sort of neur neurological incidences from vaccines. You can look at what is the one that they give girls that I'm just um, boys and girls, but girls especially like when they hit puberty and they're starting to become sexually active. Oh, my God, you guys, you know what vaccine I'm talking about. There's a lot of injuries sur surrounding that vaccine has to do with cervical cancer. Why can't I think right now? I can't believe I can't. It's like on the tip of my tongue, but you guys will know what I'm talking about. Um, the HPV vaccine, maybe that's what I'm thinking about. And then like my own, I have a, I have, uh, I guess I'll just say brother because I'm pretty sure he's comfortable if I share this, but my brother is on the spectrum and my mother swears that after he received the MMR vaccine, 
He just inconsolably cried for hours on end and then he became silent, was very difficult to arouse, like when he was sleeping, like very hard to wake up. And my mom swears that after that that vaccine, he just was different. And when she reported that, all of the side of the perceived side effects that my that my brother was having to the doctor, he just, oh, it's very common, you know, oftentimes they'll get a little sick, they might have a fever, et cetera. But that was never reported. So that's like another instance. But that's some that's some pretty strong and my mother tells it in a very convincing way. But it's like, God, like that's very tragic and very sad. And there's a ton of stories out there on the internet. They're just kind of suppressed at this point, but you can find them if you really want to find them. And they're very convincing. Another popular book is called A Shot in the Dark. It was written by Barbara Lowe Fisher. I haven't read it, but I've watched some of her interviews. She's a very convincing person when it comes to how she kind of details her child and her child being... um, injured. I think it was by the MMR vaccine. And I believe that a lot of that happened prior to the National Immunization Act of 1986. Like it was a pretty big, I think it was MMR actually. I think that was the, it was like considered one of the dirty vaccines where a lot of people were experiencing side effects. So anyhow, that's another reason. And another reason I'm skeptical is that a lot of times when they do these vaccine studies, they don't really tell you what the placebo is or was like is it truly just a some sort of saline solution that's injected into like the deltoid or the thigh of a baby or an infant or a child or whatever or is it another vaccine like i personally am not a big fan of science when you're coming out with a new drug or a new therapy and as your placebo you use another drug or therapy that's similar. Like sometimes they'll do that with statins, with vaccines, they usually will do it like, oh, well, we're gonna use, here's our new vaccine over here, and then as the placebo, we're gonna use like the MMR vaccine. To me, that's just horrible science. You want a legitimate placebo that doesn't have any effect. And the way that they justify it, the way the pharmaceutical companies justify it is is like, well, we need to give this, like let's say we wanted to come up with a new MMR vaccine, right? The way, the way they're going to rationalize this is that, well, it's too dangerous not to give this placebo-controlled group over here uh, a, a true placebo because we know that the MMR vaccine is effective and safe, and so we need to give them something. So we'll just consider our new therapeutic over here in relation to how it does with the old therapeutic, the MMR vaccine over here, and then we can do our comparison as long as this one shows some robustness and it's pretty safe and maybe it's more effective than the MMR vaccine, then maybe it can get approved, right? Like That's what happens. But to me, that's just horrible science. I feel like you probably could find a subset of parents who might be interested in just having their kid injected with placebo. Now, obviously, that wouldn't be randomized, so it's not the best kind of science, but I feel like there's ways around that that the pharmaceutical companies just don't seem to want to address as far as being able to find in, um, individuals who would receive a true placebo versus just being like, okay, they need to receive another vaccine as the placebo. I hope that makes sense. I'm just like talking, you guys. So another reason that I'm skeptical is there was a study that was done, I think it was done in Italy, where they looked at a number of vaccines and they found that vaccines were missing important ingredients that they should have had. And then they were not containing ingredients that they should have. Wait, what did I just say? Let me make sure I'm getting this right. There was a there was a study done in Italy. And what they found is that vaccines were missing stuff that they should have had. And they had stuff in them that they should not have had, if that makes sense. So I'm kind of worried about the quality of our vaccines. Another reason that I'm skeptical of vaccines is the fact that we have our judicial system set up such that you go through this specific process with judges and magistrates who look at vaccine injury all day. Like that is their job. You have to go through the court system, but it's like this specific part of this court system that just looks at vaccine injury. Like that to me, I don't know how you feel, but when I think about it, like for me, that makes me really, really skeptical. And I'm like, if our vaccines are so safe, like why do we have this? Another reason that makes me skeptical about vaccines is that every vaccine that is purchased in the United States, a percentage of that vaccine, I believe the last time I checked, if I'm remembering right, Every vaccine, I think, is a little different, but a percentage of that of that vaccine purchase, a small percentage of it, goes into a big pot to fund people who are injured by the vaccines. I'm not making this stuff up, right? So, like, I think, um, now this I might be making up the exact statistic, but, like, the flu vaccine, I think if I remember, this was probably four or five years ago, but for every flu vaccine bought, I think, like, 75 cents of that flu vaccine went into this large bucket 
to compensate those who might be injured by that vaccine. So I'm like, okay, obviously, obviously, if that is an automated process, it is legally required that a percentage of the vaccine goes into this pot. What does that tell you? Like to me, it just it just tells me like, okay, obviously the vaccines are not that safe. If they were so, 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 so safe, we wouldn't have something like this, right? And the fact that if you think that only 1% of side effects are being reported, then probably that 75 cents or whatever it is for whatever vaccine probably should be a lot higher to compensate those individuals. Okay, another reason that I'm skeptical of vaccines is when you do the cost benefit analysis and you take into account that 1% and you look at what you might be preventing versus what you might get. So let's say we want to take the flu vaccine. I want to prevent the flu versus what I might get over here. And if you look at all the data and you take everything in its totality, to me, the risk, especially in, in this case, especially for the flu vaccine, greatly outweighs the benefit. Like potentially you could get Guillain-Barre syndrome from the flu vaccine, which is this neurological disease, which which can potentially be fatal. It starts in the periphery. It's like this neurological tingliness that you get, but eventually it can cause paralysis and it can move to your lungs and it can kill people. Now it's supposedly pretty rare, but what's odd is like with my dad and my grandpa, they or my, or my grandma, they both complained of a similar symptom. Like after the flu shot, they got this weird tingly sensation that never went away in their arms. Now, is that Guillain-Barre? I have no idea. But could it be related to some sort of neurological condition? Yes, it absolutely could be. And if you look at the flu vaccine, I'll post a Cochrane study, but like the flu vaccine historically has horrible efficacy. It is not effective, meaning that like if you get the flu vaccine, it's probably not going to do anything for you. Despite every time, every season they come out with the flu vaccine, they always give like varying degrees of efficacy rather. Oh, 60, 70 percent. Like if you really look into it, you'll just see it's all over the place. But if you look at this Cochrane study that has looked at a lot of flu vaccines over the years, I think you have to vaccinate 50 people rough don't quote me on this because this is off the this is from my memory but it's around 50 people maybe 45 to 50 people to prevent one case of the flu so you got of that so that what that means is that you've got potentially like somewhere like 44 to 49 people who are getting who are rel who are healthy individuals potentially healthy individuals who are receiving this medical intervention and it's doing absolutely nothing to them except potentially exposing them to risk so my point here really is that if we had like all the available evidence we might start to see that the risk just starts to creep up creep up creep up and the benefit we're like eh, i don't really know and so this whole like one size fits all approach to vaccines to me is kind of ridiculous because I really feel like it needs to be done on an individual basis. And like for me personally, I knew that our kids were going to be more or less with us a lot of times. I knew that they were going to be homeschooled. And so they're not going to be in that communal environment that often. So why should someone like me with my kids in this particular circumstance who are going to be breastfed, they're going to be eating a very, very healthy diet, all their nutrients are going to be met, et cetera. Like why should I get say the hep B vaccine. And I know we were just talking about the flu vaccine, but, and so I'm jumping here. But after I hit like my record button on this, like my brain just goes somewhere else. So, but I think that's my point is that like, if you can look at all the evidence, you have to be able to weigh the benefits versus the risks. And then on top of that, you have to be able to look at the individual and their specific circumstance and see whether or not they're really at risk. And then, okay, maybe if they are, then maybe they do get the hep B vaccine or maybe they don't. But the way that our CDC, I feel like, really approaches it is it's like, okay, every single child, regardless of their circumstance, need this, needs these vaccines. And if you look at our vaccine schedule, like, it has just grown exponentially since the 70s and 80s. Like, kids now are supposed to receive so many more vaccines than they were back in the day. And that's another reason why I'm kind of skeptical of vaccines is I just feel like it's overloading, potentially overloading our children's immune systems. And I'm not going to be able to cite any studies right now, but there's, there's been, at least for me, I've read some pretty convincing studies that potentially these vaccines are leading to all sorts of autoimmune diseases in children. And if you look like autoimmune disease, it's not really talked about a lot, but it is just like through the roof with kiddos. It's like very, it's crazy how many kids have allergies. Like none of this stuff used to happen back in the day. And 
So I wonder, me personally, after reading a lot of research, I wonder if potentially our our over vaccination of kids might be leading to an increase in autoimmune disease. I can't say for certain, but it's a hunch that I have, and it's something where I'm like, you know what? I tend to just trust Mother Nature more than I do more than I do our pharmaceutical industry. So I'm going to go with Mother Nature on this one. And for us personally, that's like why we didn't decide to vaccinate our kids. So another thing too is like with the like with the Hep B vaccine, right? If I consider just the the potential of my kid being exposed to Hep B. So I'm just going to give you an example of like why I wouldn't get my kid Hep B for my particular situation. And then I consider the potential risk of Hep B vaccine, which could be uh, encephalitis, right? To me, it's not worth that risk. Like I would rather have I would rather go with the risk of my kid being exposed to Hep B, which is so infinitesimally small that it basically doesn't exist. And then even if he was exposed, there's also the potential that nothing will really even happen, right? Like if he's got a healthy immunity, he's breastfeeding and he's exposed, there's a, there's a chance that nothing will happen. His body will fight off Hep B and he's fine. So if I consider those two things, and then I consider the very true possibility, the very real possibility that a very small percentage of kids receiving the Hep B vaccine might get encephalitis. Then for me, I'm like, dude, I don't even want to mess with that. Like encephalitis is absolutely severe. Like if your kid gets encephalitis, there's a chance they may not recover from it. Whereas Hep B, I feel like given everything that I've talked about, I, that, so anyhow, given Hep B, like I would just rather much have my kid not have the vaccine. So I hope that makes sense. So that's another reason why I say like when I'm skeptical of vaccines, I'm not necessarily saying that they do or they do not work. I'm just saying you you can't go with this one size fits all for every single kid out there or every single individual out there. Another thing that frustrated me with the whole COVID thing is I take pretty good pride in my own health. Like I'm a fairly active individual. I eat really healthy. I think I feel like the only thing in my life that like sometimes creeps up on me is stress. Like I wonder what my cortisol levels are, but like we pretended that this COVID vaccine was just the kind of the end all be all, but there's so much more. And I'm not, now I'm not making a stance here on the COVID vaccine. I want to make that particularly clear. And it's not because of YouTube policies. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that whether or not you agree that the COVID vaccine works is kind of moot. There are so many other things involved in our immunity and our ability to fight off disease that this singular focus that we had on this COVID vaccine key, seemed a little ridiculous to me. It's almost like, hey, well, just go out there, eat some pizza, drink some pop, smoke some cigarettes and drink some beer, you guys, but get your COVID vaccine. <laughs> You'll be all right. Like, no, that's not the way that it happens. Like there's so many other things besides a vaccine that can help with immunity that I feel like why are we putting so much emphasis on this? Like, be healthy, stop smoking. There's so many other things we can do that will boost our immunity that will help prevent COVID, but yet we're not focusing on them. So whatever, maybe the vaccine works great. That's awesome. Like, okay, that's one tool that we can use to improve our immunity, but that doesn't mean that we just focus singularly on this and forget about so many other things that are important for our immunity. And I think that, like, out of everything, that is probably one of the things that really frustrated me. It's like, the place that I worked at, they wanted me to, they wanted to mandate me getting that vaccine. But if somehow we could just measure my immunity compared to a lot of other people, I guarantee my immunity was way better. Like I had very few days that I ever called off sick. You've got people that smoke all the time and don't get me wrong. I've got some friends who are smokers. All right. Nothing against smokers. I think it's disgusting, but like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to judge you for it. It's your own personal decision. But I, I tend to feel like in my own personal experience, people who smoke, they call off with all sorts of different lung stuff all the time from work. But like that wasn't focused on. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying something like, well, we should ban people from smoking. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that there's so many other factors when it comes to immunity that for us just to focus on this one thing was very, very silly. It's like there's immunity encompasses a ton of things, like just having really good sleep, for instance, eating a good diet, getting exercise, make sure, making sure you're not too stressed out. All of that stuff plays an important role in immunity. It's like we just forgot about it during this whole COVID thing. And how does this relate to me being skeptical of vaccines? And I'm not sure how I got going down on this road, but I feel like I'm going off on a tangent. Oh, right. I forgot about the ingredients of vaccines. So there's a lot of questionable ingredients in vaccines. Like they call them, I think the name is excipients, which is like other ingredients they put in there. And I believe the point of an excipient is to stimulate an immune response. So for instance, with there are some vaccines out there that contain aluminum. Aluminum is unequivocally 
a neurotoxin. You do not want aluminum in our system. Now, the reality is because of the Industrial Revolution, aluminum is present everywhere. We come into contact all the time. We eat things out of aluminum foil. A couple of weeks ago, I had a delicious chipotle, chipotle, chipotle bur burger, I had a delicious chipotle burrito that was wrapped in tin foil. The reality is, is that when you consume aluminum and it goes through our digestive tract, like a very high percentage, something like 97, 8, 9% of the aluminum is actually excreted in our feces. It's a measurable amount. You can actually track kind of like the amount of aluminum that comes out in our feces. And so thank God that our body is able to get rid of it when it goes through the digestive tract. But if you receive it in the form of an injection, the body doesn't really get rid of it. So then where does the aluminum go and what does it do? Now, there's some theories out there that another one of these excipients, I believe it's um, polysorbate 80, maybe. I want to say there's a, and this, again, you guys, it's been years since I've looked at this. So <laughs> this might be confabulation, but there was a study out there. I think it was done with mice where it showed that somehow polysorbate 80 can sort of loosen the blood brain barrier, which is an important barrier that we have to protect our brain from toxins and poisons that we don't want in there, right? So the theory is that somehow this polysorbate 80 can kind of loosen this blood brain barrier. And then once it's loosened, all sorts of these weird in ingredients from the vaccines can infiltrate the brain like aluminum. And there's some studies out there that were showing patients with dementia when they would when they did autopsies. I think it was dementia. And I think it was even those who, ha who have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, when they looked at their brains, they found larger amounts of aluminum in them. And then if you look at our vaccine schedule and you, and you tally up all the amounts of aluminum that someone could potentially receive, and the fact that the body's not going to get rid of it because it's not being digested, it's being directly injected into the bloodstream, then you start to wonder, my God, that's a ton of aluminum. Like it's a ton of aluminum way more aluminum than we'd ever want to be exposed to. And then the fact that there's aluminum in these dementia and autistic brains, like, huh, huh, right? Like, doesn't that make you a little skeptical? Like, at least more research needs to be done, right? And why am I talking about this? Oh, right, so the excipient. So why do they put, I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here, but like, why does, why would they put a neurotoxin, a known neurotoxin, the people that study aluminum out there and biology, they will unequivocally tell you, you don't want this light metal in your body. It may not be as bad as mercury, but you do not want any aluminum in your body if you can avoid it. So why do the pharmaceutical companies put aluminum in there? It's not like some conspiratorial thing, at least I don't think so, where they're trying to kill us, right? They put it in there to aggravate the immune system because the reality is when they put like say they put some sort of weakened virus or bacteria or whatever in your body you may not mount an immune response to it your body just may be like eh, here's a little particle we'll just kill it and that's it like but it's not enough to form to form a ton of antibodies to protect us in the future from this disease or virus or whatever right so what they do is they put aluminum in there and they found that by putting aluminum in there and there's a bunch of other ingredients and excipients that they, they that they that they can use that can do something similar but with aluminum in particular aluminum tends to really like ramp up the immune system and cause us to have an immune response so that we, that so that we then form antibodies to this disease or virus so um which isn't surprising, right? Like, uh, yeah, uh, it's not surprising that our body is forming an immune response when we're injecting a neurotoxin, a light metal into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that our bodies do that. So that's another reason why I personally am skeptical of vaccines is that's not something that I want in my body. And it's certainly not something that I want in my, my kids' bodies. Uh, another reason that I'm kind of skeptical is, you know, we say that vaccines are this phenomenal public health measure, but I feel like, a lot of the diseases that they've potentially kind of eliminated wasn't necessarily due so much to the vaccine as it was just to better hygiene over the years. And I feel like a lot of those diseases would have gone away on their own. And even if you really do the research, even people that are proponents of some of these vaccines, like the polio vaccine, et cetera, a lot of them will say that, yeah, the virus would have gone away on its own. We just feel like the vaccine kind of expedited the process. And then there's things like the Cutter incident. If you Google the Cutter incident, like there was, uh, it was a dirty vaccine that actually ended up causing a ton of people to get polio and and then if you really look into the details of the whole polio thing, there was a lot of times where it was just assumed like if you got the polio vaccine 
And then you started to show signs and symptoms of polio. Well, it was impossible for you to have polio because you've received the vaccine. And so what they did is they just kind of gave you a different diagnosis and they just called it something else. So it's like if you really look into the nitty gritty details, I always I always feel like the devils are in the details. You start to see a different story that kind of unravels. So that's another reason why I'm skeptical. I'm starting to think that I probably should have come up with a rubric for this video. But I will say, I guess I should point this out. I mean, I definitely think that there are some vaccines that are effective. So I guess we can talk about this because I haven't talked about this. Like another thing is that when they measure effectiveness, and this is something that kind of varies from vaccine to vaccine, but often the way that they're measuring effectiveness isn't necessarily by any sort of prevent preventative measure, meaning that, hey, you received this vaccine, how much does it actually present disease Y over here? That's not necessarily how they're always preventing. That's not always that's not always how they're measuring whether or not a vaccine is effective. What they're sometimes measuring is just did your body produce antibodies? Is there a measurable amount? Can we give you this vaccine? Then we take out these antibodies and measure them. And would these antibodies be sufficient enough to prevent maybe this injury or this disease from occurring? If the answer is yes, then they say it's efficacious. But one thing that they'll say in their package insert for a lot of these vaccines is that just because your body mounts this immune response and you get these antibodies building up in your system doesn't need, doesn't necessarily confer that you're actually immune to this disease. It's like one of those things that they kind of smuggle in there. If you watch my older video on Zyprexa, like when I talk about safety and effectiveness, they never say that Zyprexa is safe. They say that the safety of the medication has been measured, which is much different from saying that the, the medication itself is safe. And that's kind of what I feel like they do with vaccines as far as effectiveness goes, is it's like, well, we know that it mounts an immune response. We know that it that will make you produce these antibodies, but we don't actually know if these antibodies are going to confer immunity. We don't know if these antibodies are actually going to protect you from the potential disease. So that's another reason why I'm skeptical of vaccines. But like undoubtedly, like look at chickenpox, for instance, like where do we see chickenpox? You don't really see chickenpox anymore. So I would never say that like chickenpox is not effective. It unequivocally is effective. Now there's something interesting with chickenpox. This is just another tangent and I forgot where I read this. So whatever, hold me hostage if you will. But there was an epidemiologist and I want to say that he worked in California and he was, no, I think he was like a rural epidemiologist. And what he noticed, and I think this is back when um, the chickenpox vaccine was starting to become a thing. And so maybe a lot of like, I think most kids now are vaccinated against chickenpox. But when he was doing his study, and I think the, I think the vaccine was relatively new, but what he found is that where the vaccine was being used, there was higher rates of shingles. Now, you're, now you might be wondering like, okay, well, what's the, what is what does shingles have to do with chickenpox? Well, shingles is kind of like the adult form of chickenpox. And so his hypothesis was that yes, the vaccine was preventing chickenpox in kids. But what was happening is that because kids were not getting chickenpox, then these adults were not getting like secondary, tertiary, quaternary. I don't know what the word fourth is, but these these other exposures to chickenpox to kind of like, hey, give their immune system like another uh, booster, if you will, another natural booster. And because they were not getting that natural booster, then they were developing shingles. So what's the big deal? Well, shingles is another potentially life-threatening neurological disease. If you talk to anyone who has shingles, it's extraordinarily painful. So what I'll say is this, is that maybe because they weren't getting those exposures, now we're getting this increased rate in shingles. And I forget the history, like maybe now you can get to the chickenpox vaccine, then you can get the shingles vaccine, and maybe that's no longer a, a concern. But at the time, it was it was definitely, according to this epidemiologist, it was definitely a real thing. Like you were seeing an increase in shingles because there was not kids running around with chickenpox. And so like, if you look at chickenpox, it's one of those things where I'm like, is it really that big a deal? Like no one find to find me a case where someone died of chickenpox. Like it is probably one in a gazillion. Like it is so, so rare. I don't know why you'd necessarily want to vaccinate against it with the potential of increasing shingles, which is a very serious disease in adults. So you have a benign, we're preventing a benign disease in children and potentially 
causing a severe disease in adults. So that's just something to consider with vaccines in general. And that's why I'm kind of skeptical of them, like not necessarily that they may or may not be effective, but there may be these other things that are happening because we're using them is my point. Uh, by the way, you guys, I noticed that I had some snot coming out of my nose and I thought I would share this with you. I decided to pick my nose with some toilet paper and there's a little blood there. And that's because I've had the fan on at night and it's drying out my mucosal membranes. Well, I think at this point in the video, if I'm starting to talk about picking my nose, I believe I have kind of exhausted at least the reasons that really stick out in my mind for why I'm skeptical of vaccines. Again, I'm not trying to convince anyone. I could honestly care less like what your belief systems are in the vaccines. I just wanted to share why as a nurse, I'm skeptical of them based upon the research that I've done. So hopefully that answers anyone's questions about why as a nurse I'm skeptical of vaccines. I'm truly interested to hear your comments and I'm expecting to get some kind of crazy comments in the comment section. But I really, you know, if, you are, if you're interested in conversing with me about vaccines, I won't really take comments that are just like, name calling comments that seriously they could be funny whatever if you want to be a troll feel free to be a troll um it's probably karma for all the times that i've trolled people in my life but if you want to have like a serious dialogue about this you know feel free to put some put a comment below about where you feel like i don't know something that i missed or something or why you feel like you are very not skeptical of vaccines and just provide maybe a little bit of research and stuff like that and um yeah, I will try to answer your comment. So with that said, I guess we'll just kind of wrap it up there and I hope you found this video helpful. All right, so there is one point I forgot to make with the whole about the whole effectiveness thing here as I was packing up my camera. There's one other point I want to make is that a lot of these a lot of these illnesses that they vaccinate against, especially like viruses, you know, they mutate, they shift and the drift like the the virus changes over time. So it's like by the time they found out what the prevalent strain is that's circulating somewhere, I don't know, in Asia. By the time they've made the virus, made the virus, manufactured it, got it out and, and, and injected into your body, that virus has probably already changed, right? And so I almost feel like that's another reason I'm skeptical of some vaccines is that by the time we receive them, how effective are they? And is there a new strain of virus X out there that's mutated and it's not even going to care that I have the vaccine or like maybe you get a vaccine and it only covers like these specific variants and you get this variant over here. So that's just another thing that I consider when I'm thinking about why I'm skeptical of vaccines is it's like, does it, does the vaccine actually address the, the virus right now that's predominantly circulating?